All right, welcome to our wildlife board meeting. My name is Kevin Albrecht. Um, we will start our January 3rd wildlife board meeting. What a um, wintry day. We appreciate all those that have traveled up in the, in the storm both today and, and yesterday. Um, things are looking really good to help fill reservoirs this year and to help with some of the wildlife issues that we've been facing for the past few years. So that, that looks great. Uh, we'd like to start with uh, wildlife board introduction. So let's start with Bryce. Bryce Thurgood, I represent the North. Carl Hurst, I represent the Central Region. Randy Durf, I represent the Northeast Region. Brett Selman from the North. Gary Nelson, Central. All right, Wade. Uh, Wade Eaton from the Southern Region. Okay. Thank, thanks for joining us online, Wade. Appreciate that. Um, we'll, go to our, yep. we'll go to our rack chairs. Braden Richmond representing the Southern Region. Kent Johnson representing Southeast. Jason Vernon from the Central Region. Uh, Brock McMillan is running a little bit late, but he plans on being here shortly. Daniel Davis from the Northeastern Region, sent in for Brett Prevedel. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Justin Oliver, the chair of the Northern Rack. All right, um, with that, I'd like to ask for um, approval of the agenda. I make a motion that we approve the agenda. So second it. Is that a motion made by Gary, seconded by Randy? All in favor? Unanimous. Um, ask for approval of the minutes. Make a motion we approve the minutes. I'll second it. Motion made by Bryce, seconded by Gary. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, do we have any action log items, Randy? We do not, not at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, I'd like to turn the time over to the director for an update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. And excited to be here today. Lots of, uh, with the new year starting, it is a good opportunity for us to think about the many accomplishments that we had in 2022 and the good things that were able to happen. And that comes from a lot of hard work and from support from many of you in this room, as well as from our constituents out in the field. And as uh, Brett mentioned to me earlier that 2023 may be our best year ever. I think he might be right. So excited for what's coming up and for the many challenges and, and good things that we'll be able to accomplish. So uh, just an update from, from me really quick. We'll try to keep this fairly short, but uh, from our administrative services section, our black bear application period and cougar hunts will start from February 7th to the 21st with the results being available on or before March 3rd. Our general season turkey permits will be available over the counter starting March 2nd. If you missed the deadline on, I think it was the 27th to get those limited entry permits, that one always hurts me over Christmas. But, uh, and then our big game application period opens on March 23rd. Next slide, please. From our aquatic section, ice fishing is happening right now. I, I just want to emphasize, you know, how good ice fishing is and what a great family activity that can be. And also to be very safe while you're out there. I know last week we had an officer fall through the ice that was actually rescued by the people that he was going out to check. So that's a scary situation and always making sure that you're safe out there. But ice is they call it the great equalizer and being able to not have to have a boat to access the country. And so anyway, we've had a lot of success and just crazy amounts of people out ice fishing on some of these weekends, which is, which is just great to see. And I think the sport continues to get more and more popular. The other thing with our aquatic section is they've been working on their native species conservation work and that's all been planned for the next fiscal year and we're excited about those things. Next slide. 
our habitat section as part of our watershed restoration initiative, we've helped restore a total of 164,000 acres in FY22. And you can see those numbers on how much seed and how many pounds of seed and acres that were restored by wildfire. Again, I think we bring up this program all the time as far as the partnership that it is and the amazing work that is able to be done on the ground. And we're just excited to, to continue the great work that's happening and proposals are already getting sent in for, for next year's season and we're excited about that. Next slide. Our law enforcement section, still wrapping up cases from the big game season. Uh, you can see those numbers from more or less through the F through calendar year 22, we investigated 1,237 unlawfully harvested animals, totaling a little over or a little under $600,000 in value. We also have a new canine. I think the canine's name is Hawk, and it's a black lab, I think, um, that's going to be in training and will be added to our force as far as our canine program goes. And we, can we continue to see a lot of good success and public support for that program. Next slide. Our outreach section, the 2023 big game application period, it is later. I'm sure we're gonna start getting the, getting the questions as to why I can't apply yet. And that, that will start on March 23rd and run through the 27th of April. Uh, that also means the guideline or the guidebook timeline is also shifting so it won't be out as soon. We think that'll be posted online by February 7th and hard copies available by March 6th. And we'll make sure to try to get our best education out there as far as the change in that application period. And I think many are aware of that, but it was, it's still very different with this being the first year, so. Next slide. Our wildlife section, uh, big game capture work is still happening. As of December 21st, we captured 508 animals. I, I was lucky enough to show up at my parents one evening after a meeting in Price and they said, what's the division doing down on Goose Nest Drive? And I got to run down there and, and help be involved in a capture for a few minutes. Uh, we have done 439 deer, 63 bighorn sheep and six mountain goats. As many as you, you I'm sure heard our helicopter crash on the LaSalle's, those are scary phone calls to take. And we're so grateful that no one was hurt in that. We're Extremely grateful for the rescue teams. Those are, that was a dicey situation. Uh, those individuals in that helicopter were, were lucky for sure. And then those that were putting their lives on the line to rescue them also were just, when we do this work, whether it's our employees or not, it's, you know, we're all engaged together. And so it's, it's hard when you get those calls and we got lucky on that one, so. Again, the rack and board members, you have an open invitation to join us on any of these captures that we're doing. We, I get a weekly update right now on the status of our winter monitoring of our herds, whether that's mainly deer and elk. And we have been in a great situation all winter thus far. Uh, we have, you know, we have had a little higher than normal depredation issues in our northern region. Um, that may be a little more than normal after this last batch of storms as well, but our biologists are actively manage, monitoring all those herds across the state to make sure that we, we are taking the steps necessary to, to make sure they're doing well. And we've been really lucky with the amount of moisture that we've got, the timing of that moisture, and then the warm spells that we've had in between that. Uh, we're shaping up to be in a very good spot. As far as the data we've been collecting off of our captures on our, our, our doe samples, the, you know, their, their fat content isn't coming in as high as it was last year. And we actually think that's a good sign that our, our fawn production was very high and the toll of nursing fawns has taken a little bit on our does, but they're still above, above normal and above average as far as their fat content. So we're excited about that. I don't have any any fawn data to share today, but we'll have that shortly as well. Oh, and then today you are in luck. We're gonna, it's, we're gonna start the new year learning something very important. And we put together this video, worked with the Farm Bureau. So you're gonna have to 
You're gonna have to trust me on the value of this video. Last year we had legislation go through on how to how to close a gate or how to leave a gate open. And uh, anyway, we're excited to, this is your treat today is to watch this video, so. As you come to gates, out hunting and where, whatever you're doing, it is very important that you leave them how you found them. If you come to a closed gate, it's important that it's closed. If you came come to an open gate, also it's important. If you happen to change something, it can walk animals away from water or whatever. But if you leave a gate open, then it moves the livestock where they're not supposed to be and causes problems. This gate right here is probably the most common gate you'll come across. As he opens this gate, you can see he'll pull it around, keeping it straight, not tangling it up, not letting it roll, so that he'll be able to pass through here without driving across the gate. If you drive across the gate, chances of breaking the stays in the gate are real common, or catching the gate and twisting it or tearing it apart. Okay, as he closes this gate, you'll notice how he keeps it stretched out tight so it doesn't roll up on him. And that way, that way it makes it easier to shut it. As he shuts this gate, see, he pulled it straight. Now he's gonna take his knee and push on it to help him catch the loop at the bottom. Pulls that up so it's straight to make it so it's less tight. Now he'll hug the post to catch the loop on top. Most of them, it seems like it takes the hugging of the post to get them closed. This particular gate has a, has a pole that you can use for leverage. You pull it around, you place this loop on it. And sometimes there will even be an extra wire ranchers have put on there to help ensure the gate stays, stays shut. It's important that you put everything back like you found it when you close it. Okay, this here is more of the Cadillac of gates. You'll all appreciate when you're closing these kind, but it's important as you're swinging them that you don't step on them or put any pressure to interfere with the hinges. And of course, this is pretty simple. You just bring it around, unlock it. But when you lock it, make sure that this goes down and turns in that so it stays shut. Otherwise, a cow or something can bump it out. But if it gets like that, then it's pretty much guaranteed to stay closed. So as ranchers, we ask you please, when you come to a gate that's closed, go through it, that's fine. Take care of it, don't destroy the gate, and please close it. It is very important that we're able to keep our fences up to manage our livestock, as well as it affects the wildlife. I mean, if you turn them in in the next pasture before it's time, and then you're trying to hunt in that pasture, well, you've just invited the livestock to go through it with you. So please, for us, keep the gates the way that you find them when you go through them. Now you know hug the post. That was what I learned. That's been my problem in the first 45 years of my life. Not enough hugging of the post. So if you anyway, want to have it, that is my update, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Director. Any, any question on any of the updates for the Director? The biggest question that we get is when's the official draw date? And, and I, I know we give a date and then sometimes we that's a little bit ahead with the emails, but what's that official date? Did that change or is that? Lindy, do we have an official draw date? Are you talking about, so it's people like the big game commence, their... we say we will at the latest have them out this date. So is there a, a drop dead date that we can tell folks? I thought you might be referencing when people should start checking their credit card for hits and stuff I, like that, but. That, that'll go, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a flexible date. Yeah, so for this year, um, results won't be posted until May 31st, regardless. Just because we want to give us the, this is the, it's such a tight crunch this year, we want to make sure we have everything in order so we won't release it until May 31st. And then after that, we can, we always will have the May 31st post date 
but if things are, you know, in 2024 better, we can see the wiggle room, then we will do it earlier, but this year it's a hard May 31st. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, with with that, we'll start with our first agenda item. I'd just like to um, remind the audience that we have, um, if you would like to make a comment, there's some comment cards, make sure you fill out a comment card and, and which item, agenda item you'd like to speak to. We'll have you come up to this microphone um, and seeing, um, seeing the amount of um, a public that we have, we'll have time today. We'll, we'll give up to five minutes if you need to, um, if it would take you that long to give us your um, information you need to. With that, um, Kim. And just saying that um, the Utah Prairie Dog has now been listed under the Endangered Species Act for 50 years, and we've made really amazing conservation strides during that time. And we think it's time to delist the species. But in order for that to happen, we need to have assurances and a management plan in place to say how the prairie dog would be uh, dealt with after that time. So that's what this conservation strategy and the associated administrative rule represent today. So I'm happy to take any questions or, or comments you might have on that. No questions? <coughs> any questions from our rack chairs? All right, Director, uh, public comment. On agenda item number five, and I did, you should all have a copy of this today, uh, board members. The Utah Prairie Dog Conservation Strategy and amendments to R657-19 and R657-70. We just had one online comment, and that comment strongly agreed with the division's recommendation, saying that we needed to make the ESA, Endangered Species Act, work as it was designed. That's it. Perfect, thank you. All right, with that, we'll have our rack chairs report on motions. Let's start with Braden. Yeah, if I could, in the Southern region, just a quick comment, this really does impact us. It's a big issue for us, and we had a lot of discussion on this. Um, really important, and again, uh, has, has been a concern for a lot of years. With that said, we're very excited about what the division's done and where it's going. And uh, we passed unanimously to support as presented. Thanks, Braden. I, I've spoke to some of the board members about this. It, be, because of how it went through the RAC process, um, may appear that it's, that it's not a big issue, but it, it really affects a tremendous amount of people and a large landscape. And so, um, yeah, very grateful for the work that's, that's been done and the cooperation from a lot of entities to get to where we are. Kent? Yeah, we did not have a lot of discussion on this. There was a few questions and they were asked and answered pretty readily. And we also had a unanimous consent to approve as presented. Thanks. Brock, welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, the central region uh, had a motion to present, to accept as presented. That motion passed uh, nine in favor, one opposed. The one opposed, and we had quite a bit of discussion, was about was opposed to the process more than what the final product was. So opposed to how the stakeholders were put together in a committee and the representation of certain stakeholder groups on that committee. Any um, any discussion in in that of. Um, how that can can be improved? Was there anything from the rack that they that they see a problem in that, or it was just more of an opinion of one? Or so, so this person was from is from the Wasatch Front, and they just thought that there wasn't enough representation from non-consumptive users other than ranchers on that committee. That's okay. All right. since it's a non-consumptive species. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, in the Northeastern region, a uh, motion was made to accept the presentation as it was presented, and that passed unanimously. 
Uh, there was a few questions and, and more informational type questions to, to get familiar with it, but uh, very appreciative to the division for, for what they did and where they're going. Thanks, Daniel. Justin? We also, we just had a motion to pass as, as presented and that passed unanimously and our questions were mainly, how do you identify a Utah prairie dog from any other prairie dog? And it sounded like where it lives was about it. So. Thank you, five, five racks that are um, unanimous. Uh, I think it um, can be said there was a lot of, lot of work to, to get us there, so, so thank you. Um, Wade, did you have a, a comment? Uh, no, I was just gonna uh, just echo what everyone has said. Uh, this really is a great strategy and we're moving in the right direction. This does affect, as Braden mentioned, this affects a lot of us in Southern region, Southern half of the state. A lot of counties have been involved in this for a long time. So just applaud the division's efforts. This is, this is great. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll go to comments from the public. So far, I just have one. Um, just a reminder, if you have a, a comment, please turn it in. Sierra? you gave me five minutes <laughs> also that gate video is bs no one was swearing clearly fake news um so the prairie dogs right we're really really excited to make efforts to delist them that's the goal right so we're not always having things listed it drives us nuts but we support the division and we love what you're doing we just want to remind everyone gently that as we do this we want to make sure we're not infringing on private property rights when you relocate these or transplant them, I don't want them dumped in the middle of farm ground, right? They need to go out on public land. So appreciate your time, appreciate what you're doing. Thanks much. Thanks, Sierra. Any clarification on comments? Um, no, I, I think we're good. All right, um, I will summarize rack motions. Uh, we were unanimous throughout the state on on uh, the work that's been done to, to get us where we are. Sir. Okay, all right, uh, with that, we'll open it up for board discussion. I'll just make a comment, uh, you know, this this doesn't affect the entire state, but it is it is a really big deal and we really appreciate all the work that's been done to, to get these uh, Utah Prairie Dogs uh, delisted. Um, the rack and, and the uh, boards received uh, quite a few comments on this uh, online. Uh, Iron County put together a really nice letter for, uh, in support of it. Uh, Beaver County, Department of Ag, BLM. We, we did receive a lot of comments on this thing. So we appreciate all the work's been done and, and uh, hopefully we'll go forward and follow the, the plan and, and uh, everything will work great for us. I, I would just like to, uh, there, there's a lot of work be behind the scenes um, to get to where we are, um, to get this many stakeholders to, to come together and work through this, there's a lot of effort. So I'd like to, to thank all of the um, division, all the other agencies that work to get us here. Kim, thank you for, for a very good product and appreciate the efforts. Very often these species that come to be delisted are species that nobody really thinks about. But, but this is a big deal to, to get the, the, the environment or Endangered Species Act not to just be a, a pot that they go into and never come out of. So I just applaud this action and I'll make the motion that we uh, approve this action as, as uh, presented. Perfect. I'll second it. Brett? Okay. We've got a motion by Carl, seconded by Brett. Um, I'll, I'll call for a vote. Let's start with Bryce. Yes. 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 Passes unanimous. Thank you. All right. We'll go to agenda item number six, Utah Black Bear Management. Welcome, Darren. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I guess we can move straight to questions. I, the only thing I'd like to say up front is just how much we appreciate our committee and all the time that they, they spent in miles and 
and sitting in meetings and we feel like we've got a good product out of that that effort so hey, thanks darren um with that i'll go to questions from the board Okay, questions from rack chairs? All right, uh, um, have our director summarize our electronic comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On agenda item number six, Utah Black Bear Management Plan, R657-33 rule amendments and 2023 Black Bear recommendations, we had 14 online comments. Seven of those strongly or somewhat agreed with the division's proposal. Five comments were strongly or somewhat disagreed and two were neutral. I've listed the themes on here. I'll try to summarize those as well. There were multiple comments that generally supported the division's recommendations. There were multiple comments that do, do not support the use of hounds to pursue bears in Utah. There were multiple comments support the use of hounds to pursue bears, including one that asking a few bad apples not be allowed to take this opportunity away from hound hunters. And another stating that allowing hounds to pursue predators, including bears, keeps the fear of humans in predators and inadvertently makes it safer for, for predators. One comment stated that hounds had elk running all over the Dutton and they were concerned about that overlap with the archery elk hunt. Uh, one comment appreciated the increased number of units open in the spring for spot and stock hunting. There were a couple comments that well, there was a letter sent out that had several changes be made to the division's recommendation, including reducing the number of hounds from 16 to eight, eliminate the fall pursuit altogether to allow bears to fatten up for the winter, eliminate the non-resident pursuit season, and add definitions to bear regulations for at bay, cornering, injury, and waste. There's one comment supported the recommendation of allowing hunters to share bait, baits with permission. There was a comment that had concern with dropping the fall bait season, stating that sportsmen that like to use bait can do that themselves and don't have to hire someone and recommended maintaining a fall bait season during the month of September. There's one comment didn't support the division's recommendations because they felt that there was a reduction in hound hunting opportunity and expressed their want for bear hunting to be managed for more quality, not the cougar extirpation plan as they put it. That's it. All right, with that, we'll go to our rack chairs. Let's start with Brayton. Right, so we had one motion on this uh, that we accept as presented uh, with the addition of to require an education online course similar to the antler gathering course after obtaining a bear permit. And if I could just clarify that uh, briefly. So I had the opportunity to sit on the committee and maybe understand this discussion a little bit. On the committee, and Darren can address this more if he needs to, we discussed that uh, education course and uh, the pros and cons of it and the challenges with it. One thing we didn't look at during that committee was this idea of just uh, requiring the certificate after the fact. So once you draw the tag, getting a certificate sim similar to the antler gathering course. So that was a proposal is to go that route. So not everybody applying has to take the course, only those that draw and they just can take it after the fact. Um, the reason I wanted to comment on that a little more specifically is we had three opposed to our motion. All three of the opposition were that they felt like uh, we really wanted to go with a simpler plan, which was the goal of the committee, and they didn't want to see another thing added to a simplified plan. So that was their opposition. Thanks, Braden. Kent? There was actually quite a bit of discussion in the southeast region, and most of you probably already know that, that centered around a letter that we received from Grand County. And, you know, they wanted some further restrictions, Grand County, the commission actually, signed the letter, I believe the letter was written by the then Grand County attorney who has since left office. Um, they were asking for extra restrictions. They wanted restrictions on dogs. They wanted some changes in the language. And I'm kind of saddened that they didn't send their letter to all the racks before the process began. Because it, 
you know, only sending it to us. I mean, we are the rack that represents them, but what they were after and what their ask was was big enough that all the racks should have been able to see that and it should have been sent to everybody. I believe all the board members got a copy of the letter they sent after the racks had all finished, wherein they were, they were demanding some changes and they were actually drew up what they thought the language should say in the administrative rule. So there was a lot of discussion on that. Um, part of it, um, their, their letter, and I'm sure this will come up in the board's comments and discussion as well. Um, the feeling we had in the Southeast Rack and discussions we had as Rack members after we got that second letter was that it was kind of a shot across the bow. We felt like they were, you know, they were tell, they were issuing an ultimatum that they may seek further action with regard to this. So, something to think about as we go forward. And with our, with regard to our motions, um, we had one motion to ask the division's attorney Kyle Maynard to to work with the division and other entities that he felt appropriate to look at some of the language in the administrative rule to maybe tighten up some loopholes. And that motion passed unanimously. And then there was a second motion to accept the remainder of the, of the presentation with the addition that the ethics part of it be sent out to successful hunters with regulations on federal lands with regard to what's permissible on federal lands and also information to let people know that if, if you're guiding or you're using federal lands to earn money that there that does require a special use permit and that also passed unanimously thanks kent brock thank you chairman we had three motions the first motion was to ask the division to overhaul that orientation course to modernize it and to make it only required for those individuals that actually draw the tag um, rather than everybody applying since only a few percent of people actually are successful uh, that motion passed two to two uh, uh, unanimously. The second motion was to approve the remainder of the recommendations with the exception of the use of chocolate as bait. Uh, that motion failed 10 to 2. The idea there was a lot of people go gather stuff up from a bakery store or something and there's a couple of chocolate chip cookies in there and that would make that whole pile of bait useless if this passes, but it did fail. And the final motion was to approve as presented and that passed 11 in favor, one opposed, and the opposition was the same thing as the last motion. And that was the composition of the committee seemed really strongly biased toward a, a, few, a few user groups. Thanks, Daniel. Northeastern region, there was some discussion about uh, and some concern from our Forest Service partners uh, with dispersed campsites, because the rule calls out like designated camping areas. Uh, they they're, had concerns about the dispersed camping areas that aren't designated. Um, but with that said, the motion was made to pass as presented and that went unanimous. Thank you. Justin. Ours was pretty simple. We had a motion to accept as presented and it passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, clarification, Darren. Um, Nothing I, specific yet, but I think we'll have some discussion here that we can. Can, can I ask the question from the um, the Northeast region on the clarification with with the the designated camp areas? Can you further elaborate? What yeah. That? So our um, our regulations are are tied. So this is about bait placement, and um, and our regulations are tied to water and 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 designated camp areas. There, there's a distance. For one, it's 100 yards. For the other, it's a half a mile. And um, so, yeah, if you had a dispersed campsite and it didn't fall within those those two parameters, then conceivably you could have a bait station close by. Um, we did talk about, you know, if we needed further regulations on on bait stations um, in the committee. And again, our our overarching goal is try to make these 
things as simple as possible. I know we've worked with, with district, um, uh, with forest service districts in, in a lot of our regions to carve out some of those. I think the problem is technically in the rule, um, it, it wouldn't be covered. However, land management agencies have authority on their own to prohibit certain activities. And so the only, the only rub there would be that, that then people, you know, we need to require people to consult with their district forest service or BLM office to get before they applied for the COR. So that's a tough one, but we, the, the committee didn't make any changes to our rule, but that was that was the concern there is that, that maybe some of those things wouldn't be covered. You could conceive we have bait close to some dispersed sites. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, we will go to comments from the audience. Uh, Sierra Nelson, followed by Corey Huntsman. Good morning, my name is Sierra Nelson. I'm with the Utah Wool Growers Association. I actually had the pleasure of sitting on the Bear Committee and it was quite productive and great. We really appreciate the time everybody spent doing that and the things that we were able to accomplish as a group. Um, as you guys know, I'm always beating this drum. There's too many bears. There's too many bears. We need more active management of them. And I think this plan speaks to that. And I think it's going to help with that. I like the idea of there being a bear tag that's available to big game hunters or just any hunters when you get a hunting license. I think that's going to be awesome. I'm hoping it'll reflect the $10 lion spot and stock tag. I think that's going to be great price wise. I think you'll get a lot of conservation dollars that way and you'll fleece idiots like me who always put in for them. I actually am a bird hunter. I'm quite proud of my dog. And I've seen more bear sign places I've never seen it before this last fall than ever before. And it freaked me out. I was like, huh, huh. So I would definitely put in for that spot and stock bear tag and I'm excited to look for it. Um, speaking to the rest of this plan, I really think it's solid by the division. We wanna support the recommendations. I know that they got some kickback, a knee jerk reaction to one complete jerk who disregarded everything and was unsportsmanlike and did things that I just don't even feel like bringing up. But I don't think that a knee jerk reaction to that is what we need here. I think we spent a lot of time putting this together as a committee and we're really thoughtful about it. I can't imagine reducing the number of dogs just because Grand County is having heartburn. I think we need to just stick with the plan and go forward. I really appreciate everybody's work on it and I thank you for your time here. Thanks, Sierra. One of the things that uh, I heard uh, watching all of the racks was that the livestock industry was very well represented on the, uh, on the committee, so thank you. Corey? Corey Huntsman, I'm with the Utah Houndsman Association. Um, I agree with Sierra on, on the knee-jerk reaction. A, a couple years ago, there was a working group put together as well, and I was on that one. And we addressed all of the issues that came from that one bad individual. Um, we haven't had any instances since then. In that committee, we voted unanimously to have a 16 dog limit, passed all the racks unanimously, passed the wildlife board. Fast forward two years, we just passed this new committee. I was on that as well and it passed this committee the same, passed all the racks unanimously. But we, I don't see a reason to change the 16 dogs. We just haven't seen any problems since then. On the public comments, I think the others were um, the non-residents. We, we restricted them then as well, down to unlimited, down to two per unit. I, I don't see any reason to further restrict them. Um, and then uh, what was the other comment? Um, I think that was about all of the, the comments against hound hunting and, and changing laws. Oh, the verbiage, I, the Grand County's verbiage, I think that was just I mean, that would outlaw hound hunting the way they worded it. I'm not against the division at working with Kyle on on tightening that up, but I, I think that should be between the division and Kyle. And, but the Utah Houndsman Association supports the division's recommendations.
Kevin Norman representing SFW. I sitting here, you know, this, uh, this round of racks is not very scary. I think the scariest thing sitting here for me was it kind of sunk in. I realized Sierra teaches my kids in primary. That's pretty scary. Um, SFW supports the committee and the division's recommendations. And uh, thank you for your work on this. I feel it's a good plan. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Russ. Uh, Ross Worthington representing myself. Um, I had the opportunity to, to sit on this, this committee um, representing big game hunters and I thought it was quite eye-opening. Personally, I actually don't have a lot of experience with bear hunting. Um, and I had some concerns and things like that from the good old things you see on YouTube and, and a lot of concerns that have been brought up, especially around hound hunting, hound hunting and stuff like that. Um, I think one of my biggest takeaways is is really just the lack of knowledge and education of the general public of really what goes into town hunting. Um, it was one of my big things that I just would love to see more of is, is trying to educate the public um, on bear hunting in general. But um, there was a lot of work, there was a lot of give and take by every party represented and really proud of the work that we did. Everybody, like I say, had to, had to give a little, take a little, tried to simplify it um, from the hunter's perspective. I've personally experienced towns you fouling up a hunt for me. Um, but um, I think as, as big game hunters, we have to stop and pause. Those, those are the predators out there. We're, we're all complaining about our herds and stuff like that. Well, this is part of that control that goes into that, that, that has a significant impact on, on our fawns and our calves. And, and there's a little give and take, but also there was you know, moves to, made to, to limit that overlap. And so just, again, really proud of the work and everybody who's represented and would ask that it was approved as, as passed. So appreciate it. Thank you. Any uh, clarification on comments? I don't. I assume we'll, we'll talk about some of the issues. So I think for now, I'll, I'll just kind of wait and see how the discussion goes. Thank you. One one thing um, in the um, southeast region that that come up was that um, it, the the language that would allow the the use of a metal container and it, it maybe come out a little late, but but the way that is written in in rule with with Forest Service rules is that um, is not allowed. Can you speak to that a little? And yeah. So the again, yeah, that that came up. Yeah, southeastern. So uh, the concern there was that um, if you're putting out a container that may require some further action by those land management agencies to allow for that to happen. Um, so, so we did discuss that a little bit. I think I, I, I'm not sure what the rem remedy for that would be. Um, our recommendation was to allow it, but but if you couldn't do it on the forest again, that may be something the forest would prohibit or we could simply drop that recommendation for now and, and maybe work with those management agencies a little further. We did have representation on the committee, but I don't think that, that they were thinking about this potential issue. Yeah. Um, I, maybe wearing two hats, I, I would say that it would be um, not real fair to bear hunters to have it in the guidebook that they're allowed to go do that and then have them go on the landscape and could be uh, ticketed um, because they, they don't know that it's not allowed. It would just take some action and some work, uh, working with those agencies to be able to get that on the books, but it's currently not. So um, just ask the, the board to think about that as we as we move forward. It might might put a lot of our license holders in, in um, a place they, they don't wanna be, to be um, thinking that they're following the guidebook and then actually be going against land management, so just right. open it up for board discussion. Mr. Chairman, can I make a quick comment? Um, I, I was also uh, on the bear committee and uh, it was a great group. There were a lot of guys there that uh, a lot of folks on the committee that were really well versed in bear hunting and we did discuss a lot of these issues 
I think to the one point that we've uh, heard about from Grand County, there was some discussion about reducing the number of, of the maximum number of dogs allowed. But um, the discussion was, <clears throat> while 16 does seem like a lot of dogs on one bear potentially, in reality, that never, that rarely happens. Oftentimes what happens is you've got dogs coming in and out of the chase and the number of actual dogs uh, on the bear is, is oftentimes uh, just a fraction of that 16 number. And so that was why the committee decided to stay at 16. Um, um, but it was discussed at length and I do appreciate all the work the committee and, and the division's done on this. I think we've got a good product. Thanks, Wade. Bryce? Was the, the brought up in the bear committee about possibly doing the orientation like these racks have talked about afterwards? Because I, I, I love that idea. So no, the committee, the committee didn't talk about that. Um, I'm gonna ask Lindy to speak to that a little bit because it's a timing issue. So I'll let her speak to how that may or may not be able to come together. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little bit of a history on the orientation. About a decade ago, we did do this where you'd have to take the orientation once you drew out. So, that, so um, there was a lot of problems with that because of the timing. People would draw out the first, like find out the results towards the first week of March, usually towards the end. And then the spring hunt, which we give the majority of our permits to, starts three weeks later. So we have to mail those permits out pretty like a couple days after the results are posted. Um, people wouldn't be taking the orientation in time because they just got the results. We need to mail the permit out two or three days later. The majority of these people were not taking the orientation. So what would happen is they wouldn't get their permit before the season opened because of this orientation. Then they would call us and say, well, you never mailed it out to me. I didn't know I was hunting, so I want my points back. We had many, many meetings on this. And the result of this, we came to the board about a decade ago and said, we need to fix this issue. Um, and the result was to make everyone take it because they wanted an orientation. So now that's the history of it. And we're still in the same kind of predicament. The results are posted you know, March 3rd this year. The hunt opens on April 1st. Last year we issued like 37% of the spring of the quota to spring hunts. So if we make 37% of our hunters take it within that three weeks, the majority of them won't get it when the hunt opens up and we'll be back to the same problem we were a decade ago. And that's the reason why we're recommending it to do like a flyer. Because when people do get their mail, they open it up, they'll look at it, they'll read it, they'll get the information that they need. And that's why we're recommending that instead of the orientation. Thanks, Lindy. Just one thing, I think Braden's probably gonna bring this up, but I think the idea from the rack was we wouldn't tie it to the permit issuance, so a person would get their permit, but they would have to, similar to antler gathering, they have to have this piece of paper with them when they were hunting. And I don't know if you've thought about that aspect. I think maybe we misunderstood I, yeah. each other. Um, for that aspect, I see that being more of a law enforcement issue, um, just because we mail the permit, permit out, and what happens if they didn't take this course? You know, then they have a permit, and we're saying, hey, go hunt, but hey, you can't because you haven't taken this orientation, and what if they never took it? To me, that's more of a law enforcement where we would be allowing our hunters to hunt with the permit, and then um, it's doable. We do with the, the antler gathering course, so it's the same test, but we put the responsibility onto the hunters, and they may or may, may not be cited. I guess it's no different though than if when you buy a duck hunting license, if you don't, when you have your hip number and that stuff, I mean, you have to have it, it's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. You have to buy the permit, but you're the one that has to do that. So I we, mean, there could be a place on the license that says, you We know, probably have to put like a little flyer in there. Yeah, saying. did you take the course? And yeah, cause I, I don't definitely don't wanna put any more undue, headaches in your 
world, but I do like where these guys are going with that idea. Lindy, what about, didn't we have that for Lions, the flyer that came with the tag that, and, and that worked, didn't it? With the Lions? Yeah, didn't no, we have a flyer that we, came? We don't, not for Lions. We used um, to. Not in my, in my time. It's online. It's, it's strictly online where we put in the guidebook and people can go online and just take this course, but it's not mandatory. But we don't send it to them in their permit saying, hey, go take it. You know, this year we started doing the bison, you know, the, the shoot, the bullet placement. That's a flyer that gets mailed out with those permits. Um, so that's, like I said, you know, what Bryce is talking about and what the region's talking about, it's also do, it's always doable but we you know, don't want to put our hunters in a situation where they may get ticketed for not knowing. A, a question, Lindy. Um, I know sometimes when we ask for, for licensing to, um, to change, there's a big cost with our contractor to go do that. But with this, with, with being on the license, what would, what would that entail to be able to have a place on there maybe where they write their um, the course number on that and it's a reminder what would, would that be doable what, what, what does that add um to to do a whole like to write the course number on their permit would be a rewrite of the template because our templates you know for every species that has a kill tag so it has to be a unique template which could take months to put into place it's not something we could do for this one um, it takes time to create it and then send it over to our contractor to print on which we wouldn't have time by you know March 1st when we start doing everything. Um, my recommendation if we go the route is to kind of, you guys were the Swan Harvest Survey card, like a little business card that we put with our Swan permits. You know, it's just an informational saying, hey, you need to do this. So when they open the permit, they have it on there and we can, you know, figure out something where they can write to say, hey, you need to keep this number on you, kind of like your hip number. Not everyone writes their HIP numbers on their permits. Not everyone signs their duck stamp, you know. It would take some working, but the template wouldn't be ready in time for something like that in a month or two. That's something that down the road we could look into. Sorry. <laughs> the only thing I'd add is um, we'll need to take a look at there's one additional step here than, than what we currently have to do this, and, and that would be they, we need to issue them some sort of number or COR, and I'm, I'm not sure that what that would entail from licensing to add that functionality to the, to the orientation. Um, that, but you know, the idea is, is a good idea. I think we just need to work through some of the nuts and bolts if, if, we, if the board decides to do it that way. And I don't know if anybody can answer this question, but we've, we've been doing this on the orientation for a while. Did we see a, a, a reduction in female harvest or a change in the harvest when we prior to or when we did this? So we, that's one of the reasons. There are a few reasons why we made this recommendation. And that's part of it. So the initial recommendation was it, it's kind of a burden to, to take this. And if you're putting in for a bonus point, you still have to take the course. And if you're doing getting your kids in, then you've got to do it several times. And it was just a lot to do. So we took, we took a look at the data. The, the idea behind this was to try to reduce female take. And, and we didn't see any evidence that it was, it was made, I don't know, 15 years ago, it was, it was, it was uh, voluntary and then we made it mandatory. And we haven't seen any change. And if you track it with wildlife services take, which that theoretically should look like what's what's depredating out there should be more of a representative of what the population of bears looks like. We, we saw virtually no difference between what wildlife services was taken in, in terms of females and, and hunters. So it doesn't seem like making it mandatory is necessary. We still think people need to have that information. And so our, our proposal was to, and again, with the idea of simplifying things to make that information available with their permit when they when they draw it. And that's that's why that recommendation is the way it is. Thank you. 
wouldn't it simplify things that everybody that puts in has to have the COR basically, or I mean, they get a number. I mean, now you could get rid of all of those people doing it and only concentrate on a few. And granted, this would be like something that would a year from now, you know, on the permit that I really like that if they draw the permit, then it's up to them to take the class. And maybe you could even add a little bit or dial it in more. I mean, people are more focused on it. Like when you're doing it for, you know, with your kids and stuff, I mean, it's like you're on autopilot. Yeah. But if, if you actually have a tag in your hand and you know that you have to write, you know, take the course and write it down, I think it might resonate a little bit more yeah. with them. So just from clarification, it's not a COR. We actually already issue a number to people that take this course. So like if I went to my profile, I can look at my last year's orientation for bear. I already have a, a number associated with it with me. So we already have that in place. Um, you know, we do that for all of our courses. Um, it's just a, an authorization number. It's not a COR, it's just an authorization number. But it's, it's the template is just getting all the, the, the balls rolling to get it done, done. And I don't think it could be done for this year. So. One thing that I fa I failed to do, I'll, I'll do real quick, is just a summary of of the of the racks. Um, this uh, um, we we had um, in in the southeast region a lot of discussion uh, dealing with the um, with issues with with grand county trying to trying to solve some some of the issues um anything um additional from your from the racks that i need to bring up okay all right continue discussions mr chair i guess i don't understand all the angst on taking an orientation course I mean, I guess if you're taking it four or five times for every one of your kids, I mean, that could be a pain in the butt, but I don't understand why a little knowledge and information for people who are desiring to hunt bears is a bad thing. And to take that, I mean, it takes 10 to 12 minutes, you know, and, it, and it's good to see because <laughs> they do need to update the pictures a little. <laughs> but I, I don't, how is, I, I can't see that that's a big imposition if they desire to hunt bears. And even for our kids, our kids want to hunt bears. They had to go through the course, and they say it's a very it's it's an easy course. It's a doable course, but it's good information about how to identify bears. And even if it doesn't change the harvest ratio, like we thought it might, it's still good to have it. I know on a lot of the other hunts, like when you draw a buffalo tag, you, you have to do a course. And there's there's some of those, but I I thought this kind of nipped it in the bud to do it prior to even drawing the tag because you couldn't even put in unless you'd done the orientation course. It wouldn't let you. I thought that was a very problem-solving thing. So I, I just, I don't understand all the heartburn about the course. I think information's good. I just think it could be targeted to people that actually have a tag. After they get the tag, target it to those people. Because, you know, if you put in in some of the other states, you don't have to, to take a course, you know. let's just target the people that actually have the tag, you know, and, and hopefully while it's fresh on their mind that they might, you know, pay a little bit more attention because nobody is when they're, I mean, they're just trying to remember the answers just to get through the, the thing just so they can, you know, pass it. I mean, I've guilty of it with all my kids, you know, it's just, you know, you're just on autopilot, but I think if, one of my kids was to draw it and they had the tag and I was like, hey, let's go sit down and we got to do this now, you know, and then it might resonate. So I just like it after the fact. Darren. It does you, what do you see happening down in the Moab area with the uh, dog numbers and stuff. I know we, the letter was received. We all saw a copy of the letter. And 
what what do you see happening where's that headed i mean because so, it's it hasn't been that long since they restricted them from unlimited dogs down to 16. so now if they keep like chopping it down what's next four and then what after that two and then none kind of how some of the other states have done it but I, where do you see this going so the feedback we've gotten so far um, from the forest down there which really was having the biggest problem and it was mainly a, a numbers of dogs in camp and, and people kind of uh, having problems with each other that what we've done so far has actually really helped and so i think when the board this is probably about three years ago we made these changes two or three years ago at the beginning of this cycle um we we did quite a we did we, we limited the pack size we limited the the number of dogs a person could use in the spring we limited the number of non-resident permits available on the la salles of san juan and book cliffs and and the feedback we're getting is that that things have improved a lot and so i think we're in a good place with this um, kyle did meet with grand county um, a couple a week ago a couple weeks ago had a pretty good meeting um, we certainly are, aren't opposed to, to tightening things up just to make you know if, if we can to make sure that that people that are bad actors um, that we can prosecute but we want to be careful about casting too broad of a net and, and catching people that are out there you know doing an honest putting in an honest effort. So that's kind of where we are. Um, you know, there may be some way, one of the things we talked about is, it seems like one of the issues was, when, is, when does a pursuit end? And the intent and the rule is that, you know, once you tree that bear on a pursuit permit, you're done. And, and there may be a little bit of gray area there where people, and in this case, I don't want to use this case, as, but, but sometimes I think people are, they'll tree an animal, it'll jump, and they'll, they'll continue to pursue. I think the intent for a pursuit permit is that once you, once you have that animal at bay, then you're done. You pull the dogs and, and come back another day. So um, we, Kyle and I talked about maybe there's some ways to do that. I think time-wise, as far as the things go, um, I would recommend any changes we made go through the racks. So we'd probably be looking at next year if we wanted to do something like that rather than trying to hammer it out here in a meeting. But, but Kyle and I have already talked. We can certainly take a look at that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, the other thing, um, just real quick, Lindy said it would be possible to get something. If, if we wanted to do, a, once you draw a permit, take the, the course, that's something we could implement this year. We just, they print something off like they do with antler gathering. And she felt like that's something we could have in place by the time people draw their permits. So just as the board contemplates that. I'd, I'd like to share uh, my my perspective on this. I um, This kind of hit close to home this year in that um, I was at work, um, I, I work rel relatively close to my home and I got a call from a neighbor who had said they had a, a bear in their backyard and so I, I, I ran up and sure enough, they had a bear in their in their backyard and um, it, as it moved off, it went towards my house. Um, I called the division quickly and because it was so close to residents, um, they said, well, yeah, we probably ought to um, tree that bear and, and so that it doesn't get, get itself in trouble. And so was able to call a local houndsman and immediately that, that bear was treed. It was so close to my home that my wife was able to stand on the porch and look eye to eye with 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 the bear, um, but but being able to call that houndsman and have them come tree that bear does not just happen. Um, there was a lot. There's a lot of training behind the scenes for that houndsman to have good dogs to be able to tree that, and and had they not been able to do that, that may have been a bit a different outcome for that bear. That that bear was so close to homes that they may have had to euthanize the bear, and so there there are so many instances where that is, that is great. Um, but but I want to speak. I have a lot of friends who who are houndsmen. And I I want to speak to them um, because I feel like there are a small few. But since we've made the changes, the last three years we've made great strides. But I feel like one of the things where there's a loophole is that there are there are still some non-residents that are bringing their dogs and putting them together with Utah residents under the Utah resident license and adding to that number 
of 16 that can still be causing some of this issue. And I think that can be solved with our Houndsman Association. I think that they can t work within their own members and have those discussions and say, hey, if we, get, if we don't solve this ourselves, we are gonna be the ones that take this away. And, I, and so I, I wanna speak to them and say, hey, you have the opportunity to solve that. You, you know the tools and you, you have the membership to be able to reach out to them. I think that's one of the better ways to do it, but I, I think that they, they need to have those discussions. I think they need to try to solve that. Um, but that would be my recommendation, speak, speaking from friend to friend. So. Just a, a little conversation about the barrels again. I, I remember the days when we, we, we struggled to get approval for bait locations. And, and that, was, that was generally for a service. Uh, the relationship was not what it is now. And, and we're in a good position. And if, if taking away the barrel proposal in this is, a, is an easy way to, to maintain that relationship, I think it's a simple thing. I, I've never used a barrel, done a lot of bait hunting. You can still hunt bears without one. And if that's a, um, a that just seems to be a very simple thing to, to remove to help maintain that relationship when we're making significant adjustments on how you get a permit and what's gonna happen on land that they manage. And it just seems like a simple thing to me. So, and I'd, I'd like to add to that. I think that um, Darren just spoke to that. Um, you know, if, if some of these things we need to look at in a mid in a mid plan review, um, that that could be something that if we pull that out now, we could have ask the division to work with the the Forest Service to maybe have that ready when that review comes. Yeah, I just I was just going to say this is an issue that kind of came up late in the process that the initial thinking and, and the, the committee members who were with Forest Surf and Service and BLM was that you know, this would be this would be nice because it'd be keep the bait contained and it'd be easier to clean up afterwards. So I, I would just, you know, yeah, I, I think it's probably time to sit down with those agencies anyway and look at our MOUs and some of these issues. So, um, yeah, if you need to pull it out today just to make sure we're not stepping on any toes, I think. We could certainly work through that. Thank you. Um, I, Kyle, I, I would like you to maybe um, speak to the the language and and where we are, and and if there's any any actions that the board needs to take with that. Morning. Yeah, Kyle Maynard, the Assistant Attorney General for Wildlife. Um, so at the moment, I don't have any proposed language, um, like Darren said. So I had a, a good call with um, Christina Sloan, the former prosecutor, and Trish, the Grand County Commissioner, uh, right before the holidays. And um, we talked through you know, a couple of different topics on their letter. Uh, but the big thing I asked from them is, is give me some time to look at where the rule is deficient and talk to, you know, talk again with Grand County, talk to um, law enforcement, talk to the Houndsman's Association, and let's figure out what rule change would make this more clear and better, um, and how to how to prevent this from happening again. What makes this more clear? Um, what I'm afraid of and, and what I didn't want to happen is something get rushed and we end up with something that's difficult to enforce or doesn't enforce the right right thing. Um, so right now my plan is to, at the new year, touch base with uh, different people and different groups. And then I have a phone call mid-month again with, with Grand County and just keep talking over issues and work with Darren to come up with some, some possible rule changes. Thank, thank you. Yep. Um, maybe just to repeat what, what I heard is that a possible solution would be that maybe the board could just um, ask um, that, that you continue to work on that, that would, that would give you some time to work with all those parties you stated and that you could, after this meeting, get that language right. Yeah, I think that'd be appropriate. Thank you.
So three three things that I've written down is um, that that asks that we kind of break down is um, do do this piece by piece, but um, we need to dis discuss that course. Um, probably the opportunity to to remove the language of the barrel at this time, maybe have, bring that back. Um, I think there's an opportunity for a mid mid plan review that, um, and then also ask um, that. Um, Kyle and the division continue to work with those parties to, to get the language on that rule. Mr. Chairman, um, what about the, was that um, spot and stock over the counter uh, bear tag like we have for lions, was that in the plan? The, someone mentioned that. You mean the price of the permit? Or, just... or, so we do have a spot and stock permit available. The difference, um, we used to have a cheaper permit available we could use for lions. It used to be 30 bucks, and I, I believe the board passed that recommendation to the legislature to reduce for cougars to 10. Uh, the committee did recommend that we, that we look at having a reduced price permit for spot and stock bear uh, over the you know, hound or bait permit, but that's something that would have to go through the legislature. So if the, uh, yeah, if the, if the board accepts our recommendations as presented, there, there'd be some discussions about trying to get that into the pipeline to, to have a little bit, it's a much, it's not as low success as lions, um, but it is still pretty low. And, and I think we could justify a little bit less expensive permit for, for spot and stock bear. Okay, but that is in the plan. That is in the plan. Yeah, that's that's something okay. the committee is recommending that we look at. Can we, um, obviously you want to chunk this out. And can we take, can I take a stab at the course thing now or, yeah. wanna, okay. Yep. I just, and I don't want to do it for this year because I don't want the division to feel rushed that, you know, they have to, do this here in the next few weeks, but I'd like to make a motion that we look at um, removing the orientation course and doing it similar to the antler gathering where they issue their permit, then they take the course and uh, make that mandatory for 2024. And so clarification on that, so that it, um, they would just have to have that before the hunt. They would just have to show that as, as proof when we, yeah. in the field. Just like in the field on their license. Yeah. Thanks. Any questions on the motion? Okay, do we have a second? I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Se seconded by Carl Hurst. Any discussion on the motion? Um, I will just state that that Wade had to Wade had to step out. He would be on a meeting for about thirty minutes, so we he may be um, not in this discussion for this particular vote. So, any discussion? Just, just really quickly, um, I would recommend that if we do that, that we we maintain. And this may be what you're thinking: we maintain the mandatory system that's currently in place. So so this year, in order to apply, they would still need to take the course. And then look at maybe next year changing that that system. Correct for 2024. Okay. Perfect. Is that clear among board members? Okay. All right. Any other discussion? Call for a vote. Start with Bryce. Yes. 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 All right. Um, motion um, passes with with. Uh, we call that an abstention, Stacy. or? Okay, all right, thank you. Chairman, I'll take on the barrel issue. Okay. I'll make the motion that we, that we remove the barrel allowance uh, in, the, in the bear plan currently, and that we allow the division to work with our land management partners to resolve that issue in the future. I'll second it. Motion by Carl, second by Randy. Is that motion clear, Stacy? Okay. Any discussion on the motion? 
Right, I'll call for a vote. Rice? Yes. 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 Motion passes unanimous with um, with, with Wade absent. Chairman, I'll, I'll uh, take a, a step to language. I'll make a motion. We ask Kyle Maynard to work with the division to uh, strengthen the language um, in, in going forward, uh, not not particular at this time, but but um, as as he gets it worked out, so it'll come forward and and uh, come back through the RAC process at a later date. I'll second it. Okay, we got a motion by Randy, second by Gary. Um, any question on the motion? All right, I call for a vote, Bryce. Yes. 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 Motion passes unanimous with uh, Wade absent. Um, well, before we get to the to the end of this, one thing that I would um, list, listening to Darren that they are open for a for a mid plan review. Um, Knowing that there's some issue with with a number of hounds, um, we're we're three years into um, some new um, rules that have made significant strides. I think an opportunity that we have is to ask the division to um, from this this point till the mid year review to really look at um, that number of hounds on those three particular units: the Book Cliffs, the LaSalle, and the San Juan, and and come to us at mid midpoint review, and if we need at that time to make any changes, that would be more a more appropriate time that we've had time to look at if if there needs to be a change. Um, I I'm not putting that in a motion, but I would put that out for consideration from the board that maybe that would be the time we would look at that. Welcome back, Wade. Thank you. Sorry, I had to step away for a second. No, no problem. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to make a motion at this time on the on the hound uh, numbers, just because uh, we we did change it three years ago, and it seems to be working. So. So we we Wade. Um, so we have made some motions. Um, I'll I'll take a tackle at it. Board help me. So we we did uh, make make a motion um, on the uh, um, yeah, on the ori orientation that it be like the antler point restriction. Um, we did remove the language on the barrels, um, and that would take effect in 2024. Um, and um, Randy made a motion. Yeah, you know, the motion was to ask uh, uh, Kyle Maynard to work with the division to strengthen the language in the plan as needed so we could uh, prosecute some bad actors better. Okay. And so that, that's where we're at. We're, okay, thank uh, you. But, but, the, but we're still open uh, on this issue, so. I think we covered um, the, the main topics that were discussed from the racks. Is there anything that we that we missed looking at the rack chairs? We stuff come out of the regions. We covered that okay. All right. We look for a, a, a motion to encompass everything. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the divisions, the remaining recommendations as presented, along with the caveat that. We do a mid plan review to look at any issues that might need to be reviewed. I'll second it. We got a motion and a second. All right, any discussion on the motion? All right, I'll call for a vote starting with Bryce. Yes. 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 Right, motion passes unanimous. All right, with that, um, we, we will go to agenda item number seven, Fur Bear and Bobcat season dates. So uh, this pretty much represents a, just a change for calendar year on the, on the season dates, but, but not a lot of changes. Just 
One question. I'm just looking out at all that snow out there. We haven't had that for a number of years. Is it, have, have you seen a, are we taking more bobcats now? Are we taking more fur bearers this year? Or is it too early to tell or it's just a whole different year this year? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen the numbers. It seems like year after year though, what seems to drive bobcat take is the pelt price more than anything. So um, if prices are high, we see more taken. And if they're low, that we, we see a dip. So that's probably where we are with that. Just curious, where is it? Is it kind of uh, low or is it high or what? It's just still down, what do you it? expect? Still down a little bit. It's come up. So I'm looking at the Trappers Association <laughs> for that answer. I haven't looked at the current price. It's not as high as it was, but but it's it's gotten a little better. So we may see more. Questions from the rack chairs? I I have one. Darren, in our in our rack, the conversation came up about a non-resident license. Um, can you discuss that? I know there was conversation about coyotes and not being a Yeah, so um so there was a, a proposal from the Trappers Association to uh require non-residents who, who come to Utah to trap. For, for what any reason to acquire a fur bearer license, non-resident fur bearer license. The concern that they had is that a lot of other states are requiring that, uh, that you know, if they go to Nevada, they've got to purchase an out-of-state trapping tag. But if someone comes from Nevada here and they only want to trap coyotes, this is the, this is the issue, then they don't, they don't need to have a permit. They do have to have a trapping number, which is a $10 one time COR that, that everybody gets. We passed that four or five years ago. Um, I've had a chance to talk to Kyle about it. it. It's really tough. In Utah, coyotes are not managed by us. We don't have authority and, and it would be difficult for us to require a license for, well, impossible for us to require a license to track coyotes. Um, I like the idea. I feel like, you know, we ought to reciprocate and be fair, but um, because of the way that coyotes are managed in Utah, it, it, it's difficult. So that's a tough one, yeah. So, so let, I don't know if this question's for Darren or Kyle or director, but to, to solve that, um, would um, that need to be in statute or would we need to work with the Department of Agriculture to, to bring something forward? What, what would be the appropriate steps if we didn't want to just drop this? Yeah, I'll let Kyle speak to that. Uh, we would need to work with the ag and see where to start from there, but they have the management authority over coyotes. Thank, thank you. Darren, one question that that brings to my mind is our trap registration or trap number that is issued to a non-resident that's currently $10, that's right. the same as the resident price. Could this be fixed by making that more expensive and that they would need that regardless of what they're trying to do. I think that'd probably be the, the easiest thing to do. The, the argument we made for acquiring a trap license, to a registration uh, several years ago is that because of incidental take, that the, the division had the authority to regulate those devices. And and so if, if you're putting them out for coyotes, there there is a chance you may catch something you didn't intend to. So, so could we increase the COR fee for non-residents? I, I, I guess we need to do a little homework. I don't know if we can do that unilaterally, if we need to have the legislature sign off on that, but that, that would be a way to address it. And I feel like just in, in fairness, we ought, to, we ought to make sure that, that they're kind of playing on the same field with our, with our state trappers. Well, I thought we were gonna get through a meeting without Colby. Uh oh, <laughs> I was wrong. I, I, I think we just want to. I want to make sure we go on record, and you know, when we say Department of Ag has management authority over coyotes, I don't think that's completely accurate either. I think it's just that they're in, 
an, I mean, if you wanted to have a, a pet coyote or whatever, I guess you'd have to have some kind of COR, which would probably come from Department of Ag. But as far as managing wild coyotes, uh, Department of Ag works with producers to help control those when areas they need to, but really no one has management authority over it. They're just unprotected. They're an unprotected species in the state. And so um, I just wanted to make sure we got that corrected. That's all. Thanks, Thanks. Coley. But, but Colby, would that change the, the recommendation for maybe a, a, a COR non-resident increase with, with that? But I don't think that would change that, would it? it it's, it, I guess it's still the fact that there, there's no, yeah, there's just no, there, there's no management authority that resides with us or with them. So I, I, I think, I think the difference, and this is again, the argument we made when we required this of everybody is that we're regulating a method of take and there is a potential impact to protected species that we manage. And so therefore, I think the vehicle, the best vehicle is probably to, to look at the COR price and, and, and maybe adjust that for non-residents so that they're contributing um, to, but, to the state management. But isn't, but, isn't that ahead. just a, a one time fee? Yeah, so yeah, they'd, they'd only need to pay it once and once they had the number, um, they'd be good to go. And so that probably wouldn't be retroactive either. So if a non-resident currently has a trap license, they'd already have it. So it'd be for new ones. So that, that's something to think about too. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so clarification, it's not a COR. <laughs> it's, it's a trap registration license. Um, it's not a certificate of registration. So non-residents can purchase the trap registration license for $10, the same price as a resident. If you guys were wanting to change that fee, it would be a legislative action, just like any other fee change. So. Yeah, I, I got confused on that. It used to be, but there's a reason it's a license. A good reason there's a li it's a license, because we can revoke it. Is that clear? <laughs> so it'd be, it'd be similar to the permit for bears. We'd need to ask the legislature for an increase if, if we want to do that. So the guys from out of state can come and trap coyotes here and there's no regulation on them at all. They don't have to have a Utah trappers <laughs> license they, or anything like that. They need the trap license to put a trap in the ground currently. Um, but if they're only trapping coyotes, they don't, we, they're not required to have any other kind of license. Um, now, if they catch something they didn't intend to and it dies, that's a problem. They, they don't have a license. And How much? Especially if they're doing it, we're trapping coyotes and, and hoping we catch other stuff. Right. Um, but the trap license should, it was meant to address some of those concerns. Well, what's the difference in price for an out-of-state trap license versus a Resident. Good question. Do you know, Lindy, off the top of your head? <laughs> I'd need to look. I thought somebody just said it was the same. Ten dollars. The trap license is ten dollars. The if That's we're talking the about the fur bear license. Oh, it's the fur bears. Yeah. It's yeah. More. So if they want to come trap bobcats or some other protected species, they have to pay for a non-resident license. I'll look that up for you really quick. I'm getting old enough, I can't remember all this stuff off the top of my head anymore. Well, while he looks that up, I'll ask our rack chairs if they have any questions. Go ahead. I was just going to say, how many people are we talking here? Like, how many non-residents come to Utah to trap coyotes? 20, 30? I, I, do, I do know one that I had communication with this year that come out for, for three weeks for, and drove all the way from Pennsylvania. So it, it, it is a bit of a destination with having that, um, the, the price that we pay. Yeah, they, they could bounty them, so there's probably a little more interest than 
And if they're catching coyotes, good for them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, and non or non resident fur bear license is one hundred and seventy seven dollars, and it's thirty twenty nine for residents. Thanks. I had a similar question to Brock, but I had one other question, kind of comment, but. I, this is a serious question. Have we ever discussed restricting the take of coyotes? Yeah. Yeah. It's a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll ask the director to um, summarize our electronic. Comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, on agenda item seven. 2023 fur bear and bobcat season dates, we didn't receive any online comment. Thank you. We'll go to rack chair's report, start with Braden. Yeah, in the Southern Rack, we had a motion to uh, accept as presented and that passed unanimously. In the Southeast Rack, we had one motion to pass as, as presented and that passed unanimously. That Central region was the same, motion to pass as, as presented, passed unanimously. Not to sound like a broken record, but the same motion was made in Northeastern region and it passed unanimous. We changed it up just a little bit. So we had to recommend um, to, to accept as presented, but in addition, looking into adding a non-resident uh, license to trap in Utah, or at least a higher fee for a non-resident to trap in Utah, as I questioned earlier. Just say thanks to our Northern region to, for pick, picking up the pieces when the rest of our regions may miss stuff. So thank thank you. Just just kidding, we we really appreciate it. I hope the rack chairs and, and the racks really um, know how much we count on them to, to pick up um, some of the, the stuff going on in their regions. And we appreciate your time and effort, especially on a on a wintry weekend to come up and, and uh, present. So thank you. All right. With that, we will go to um, public comment. We'll start with Cody Bassett, followed by Walker Sick. Walter, okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Cody Bassett, representing the Utah Trappers Association. Um, we we accept the proposals given by the division for the season dates, um, like it was discussed just just previously about um, the non-resident trapping license. It's a major concern that we're seeing and it, it gets worse, especially when prices increase. Um, you know, it, it's something that we would like to see happen because we get calls and complaints all the time about non-residents coming in, the fairness issue. Um, we looked at the idea of the fur bear just as there's already a system in place. Um, I don't, obviously with the language and the regulation that we just looked at more of the fur bear, you already have the course when non-residents come into this state, they're at least educated on our trapping laws. Whereas you go to other states, it's completely different, especially when it comes to baiting and stuff like that. Um, so we looked at the fur bear to kind of be that, I guess that kind of guide stone for them. Kind of, there's already a system in place. It's just, we we're hoping to see the language change a little to make it required that they're taking the fur bear course, getting a fur bear license. Um, the one problem we see is if you just do on the trap tag number and just do a one-time fee, it's still a one-time fee, and then you're still going to have continual problems with education on, on non-residents coming into the state because they just have to pay the one-time fee. So that's one concern we see, but if it has to be about the trap itself, having a license that they have to renew every year, um, and so be it. Um, we just want to have the residents of the state be put at the top priority, especially trappers in this state harvesting Utah animals um, or fur bears. Um, because when you go to other states, like for instance, to go up north, you're looking at three, $400 just to trap a muskrat where they'll come down and they can just trap them for free. 
practically. And so we would like to see this non-resident trapping license take effect, or at least a way to implement it. So that way we're putting the residents of Utah first and also protecting the wildlife that is in Utah. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Hi, my name is Walter Zarek. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm I'm representing the public today. Uh, I support the division's recommendations. Uh, one thing on the trap uh, non-resident trappers is is that uh, we have guys coming over, and we're just I'm worried about uh, the non-residents sneaking protected species over state lines. I uh, so that's what I've heard. I uh, but. All in all, I just represent, I mean, I support everything that's been said. Thank you. All right, I'll summarize the, the motions. I think uh, that's that's pretty to, pretty easy to summarize. I think all all racks were, were in line. Um, with exception of the northern region that we discuss um, the non-resident issue. And I think that that's been brought up with, with good discussion. We'll uh, hopefully continue that discussion. I'll open it up for board discussion. So I'm, I'm confused. We have a non-resident fur bearer license that's more than ours, than a resident. And so so somebody can come set traps for coyote and they're fine as long as they don't catch a protected species and then they're not fine. And so that turns into just a law enforcement thing, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that again, that's the reason why we require everybody to have a trap license and a number on their traps so if we find sets law enforcement can follow up figure out who they belong to and so that that definitely has happened it's just this is more of a as you heard from the trappers association just they feel like the, the non-residents are getting kind of a sweet deal in utah and 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 they're not they're not getting a similar deal as if they go to other states that's kind of what's driving the concern Um, do you think it's something that we could do like a action log item later that we look, have the division look at this and bring it back to us and say, really, I mean, how many people are doing this? You know, how many really out of staters are there? Like Randy said, or Brock said, I mean, is there, are we talking 20 people, 30 people have them come back? And if, if it's, you know, maybe a bigger thing then maybe they could give us a recommendation. It's like, okay, instead of the $10, maybe it'd be 20 or $30 or, we require them to have the fur bear, but I'd like to see them bring back more information before we just, because like I said, at the end of the day, I mean, we're talking coyotes and I think a gone coyote's a good coyote. I'd, I'd like to turn the time over to the director to maybe speak, speak to that in action log. So a couple things, we have a fee increase that the board voted on and then is actually before the legislature now. So we're too late for board action to adjust a fee, but we're not too late to ask the legislature to adjust a fee. So there is some some things that could be looked at in thinking about it right now. Uh, and to what Brett said, you know, and Darren has spoke to it a couple years ago, we created that trap registration license as a means for everyone that wanted to put steel in the ground, regardless of what they were trying to catch, that we would have a mechanism to then actually revoke a license so that, you know, if you, if someone wasn't playing by the state's rules for trapping that, you know, then they couldn't just go out and say, well, I'm just trying to catch coyotes now. No, you're, you're done putting steel in the ground if you can't follow those rules. So I think that's why you see the same fee there. There are, 
you know, as was presented by the Trappers Association, you could make that license one year for a non-resident as well, and they would have to renew every year, or we could change a fee there. But that's the reason that trap registration license was put into place a few years ago. And so really, I think for the non-resident piece, the division was just thinking about the fur bear license as if they were here to catch protected species, they have to have that in addition to bobcat tags if they wanna do that. So um, I think that's a little bit of the history and we do have a couple options there. But timing wise, I mean, changing that, that tag registration to make it just one year for non-residents and I mean, you could probably at the legislature ask for an increase in the cost right now, but changing that can't happen right now. Yeah, timing wise, I think our option right now would be to ask the legislature to increase that non-resident fee for and, a trap registration license. And just just as part of discussion, I mean, I, I we all want people trapping coyotes, but, but the impression that every other state is increasing when I apply as a non-resident, they're, they're, they're double and triple and everything and so I think there needs to be a small increase maybe not a large increase but I still think we want to encourage people to come and trap our coyotes but the impression that 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 non-residents should be charged more I think is right on point I think we should uh, Darren other than the um uh the fur bears uh, license and the trap registration we do not have a resident uh, trapping license, is that correct? We don't require For fur bears, bears, but yeah, if, if a resident fur, is trapping coyotes, you then they only You got the fur bear permit, you got right. the fur bear course you have to take, you have you have the registration, register your, your uh, trap number. Correct. Put on your trap, but we don't, we don't have a, a resident trap license. For coyotes. For, right. coy for anything. We, we do for protected species, so if they're trapping Bobcats, they do need to have a fur bear license. A fur bear license, right. But right. there in is addition, a non, non resident fur bear license already in place. Right. right. Yeah. So the rules are the same for both. It's it's really just a fee discussion. You know, okay. should we charge non residents more? Thank or not? you. Wade, do you have anything that uh, you want to bring forward? No, I, I don't think so. I, I agree with Bryce. I, I think if we're going to, if we're going to make some uh, changes on this, I, I think we'll probably ought to review it just a little bit more. I'm good the way it's presented though. I, I think one solution um, could be the action log item that uh, give the division some time to, to look at, at the issue. They, they can go take care of the fee right now, um, but I think it's, it's great to, to further that discussion and have the division come back to us with, with more time. And I personally wanna see a fee increase, but I don't know what that is. So I'll make the motion that we place on the action log a trap, a non-resident trap regi registration fee increase and, and do some work to determine what that number is. Second that. Okay, Mo motion by, by Carl, um, seconded by Bryce. Question for the director, if we put that on the action log, is that way, does that still give you opportunity in, in this les legislative session to, to go work with? That's a good question. I think we miss this legislation <laughs> and I think we go for next January. I think it I mean, would I, be, uh, it might, it would be tight for sure. I, yeah, I sure. don't see any way we could do it this, for this one, but I would love to see it at next January. Okay. Perfect, any discussion, any, anything from Darren? 
All right, I'll uh, call for a vote, Bryce. Yes. 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 Motion passes unanimous. Okay. Look for Make the motion that we pass the fur bearer and bobcat season dates as presented. I'll second it. Okay. Motion by Carl, seconded by Randy. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I'll ask for a vote starting with Bryce. Yes. 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 Motion passes unanimous. All right, with that, we will go to agenda item number eight. Um, Cougar update by Darren. So this was informational, but I did want to make one point of clarification that came out of our guidebook discussions. Um, for Cougar units that are limited entry and then change to harvest objective, um, traditionally we, we've we had a, a little bit of a gap between the end of the limited entry season and the beginning of the harvest objective season to allow us to consolidate our information, get paperwork in just to make sure when we tell them how many permits are left that we've got the right number. And so uh, the initial recommendation or the information was that, that that hunt would begin as soon as the limited entry portion ended. So the next day, um, we're just, we just need a couple of days there. So for most, uh, there aren't that many units that fall into these split seasons, but for most, uh, the 18th of uh, March, would be the end of the limited entry season and then they would open on the 22nd rather than the 19th. And then we have two units that, that have a longer limited entry season and a similar thing. There'd be a couple of days. So instead of, so they'd end on the uh, 30th of May and then open for harvest objective on the 23rd, 20th, they'd end for limited entry open on the 23rd. So that, that's just, again, something, a little bit of an oversight that someone on our guidebook committee caught. So we just wanna make sure the uh, board was aware. But again, this is informational, so don't need any board action, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Darren. Any questions from the board? Okay, questions from the rack chairs? Um, we have one comment card from the public and um, would, would like invite any of the other public that want to speak on it, they can bring up a card. Sierra? I was going to go home and then I couldn't resist. Um, I just want to bring up again that we have too many lions. We have too many lions. We're seeing problems with them everywhere, places we didn't even think we'd see problems with them, cough, bighorn, chief, cough. We've got too many lions. And so as we come in next year and you know finish out this management plan and things we're doing with it, I, I really think that's something that we need to look to in the future. And we need to start brainstorming ways that we can help with this problem because you can see it in your deer herds. We see it in ag, they'd mirror each other all the time. So something worth looking into. Thanks you guys, sorry. Have a good day. All right, with that, um... We will uh, bring it back to board for discussion. I'll make a motion we approve uh, the update on the Cougar dates. I'll second it. Okay. Mo motion by Randy, seconded by Gary. Um, I'll ask for a motion starting with Bryce. Yes. 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 Motion passes unanimous. Um, we have lunch ready at uh, 1130. We'd like to invite all those that are in attendance to know that uh, you're, you're welcome to stay. Um, one thing that I'd like to, to mention is this, this week, starting on Thursday, we have WAFWA, the Western Association of Wildlife Managers, where um, all of the Western states meet with their directors and um, commissioners. Um, we're, we're the only wildlife board, the others are commissioners, but they meet and discuss all of the topics around the West and they meet every six months. This meeting will be in New Mexico, but I just wanted to speak to the importance of that. Um, 
before sitting on the board, I had no idea about those meetings. There's both um, the WAFL, which is the Western states, and there's AFWA, which is all, all states that participate in that. And the division is does a very good job of being very involved in that. There's a lot of work that goes on. Uh, I would say um, there there is probably more opportunity and work to be able to work through the, those associations because a lot of those states have already faced the issues that we may be discussing and there's there's lessons learned and and there's things happening on our borders that if we have those relationship with those states we can reach out to that director or that board member and say hey did you think about when you made this restriction and how it may affect us? And so um, I would just make the plug that uh, if you haven't been involved in WAFWA and, and AFWA to, to get involved in those um, and hopefully here in a, um, at our next board meeting, we will, be, we will bring back um, some, some of that information. Um, anything from the director? Thanks, Mr. Chair, for bringing that up. I just, to add a little bit to that, attending these meetings is not something new for me, but it obviously is in the director's seat. And there's a lot of decisions that are made uh, landscape level that is affecting all of the West that we're able to work through together as directors. And many of our employees are on these committees or chair these committees of different aspects that are happening across our country with wildlife issues and we are heavily involved with both WAFWA and AFWA and we we get some great benefits from doing so. So uh, yeah, it takes uh, some time from our employees who also I think learn and grow a lot through those processes. So it's a great thing to support. The other thing I would mention since this is just such a short, sweet meeting is that the wildlife board application is open four slots and I think the deadline to apply is, I'm gonna say March 31st, no bonus points needed for that. So is that right, Stacy? March 31st. And, and I just like to add a, a plug for that. Um, I, I, would, I would share that uh, um, it, it's, it's a great opportunity if you feel like you have too many friends, um, the, wildlife, <laughs> the wildlife board is a great place to solve that problem. Um, but, but I just take, make a plug that um, there, we have some um, great opportunity to, to make great headway in the state and, and uh, I, I am very grateful for the opportunity that I've had to learn the, the process and so, and if you've, if you've th been thinking about that, make sure you get your, your application in. I, I would put a plug in that how important it is to, to step outside of your personal um, issue and be able to look at a landscape scale and be able to look at all the input from all of the racks and be able to vote what's best for the resource, I, I feel is, is if you feel like you can do that, you would be a great applicant. So, Stacy. Can I just add a couple of clarifications to that so I'm not getting a ton of applications from people who can't apply? Um, for this year, we're recruiting for two open seats. One, of course, is Kevin's and one is Carl's. Kevin's position must be filled by someone who resides in the southeastern region, so that one will be region specific. Carl's can be filled by any region that doesn't currently have two representatives. So in this case, if you do the math real quick, those of you who live in the northern region are not able to apply. So you'll need to sit this out for two more years. Um, the application is found at boards.utah.gov. It's not on our division website. It did open Sunday. Um, you do have to create a log on to go in and put your application in, so don't let that intimidate you. And if anybody needs any help, I'm happy to help them with that. Um, you can go in and edit and add to your application. That's new this time. So if you want to go in and take a look at it now and then go back and put your serious application in, it will allow you to do that. So um, any letters of um, support also need to be submitted with the application. So you'll wanna gather those then. And again, if you have any troubles with it, you can reach out and I can help you do that. Our RAC recruitment, just so that we don't confuse it, will not open until April. 
So the board application is January through February and then open rack seats will take applications through that in April and that will be through the division's website. Thank you. Any questions on that? Okay. Any other business? I think Chad hasn't talked to this meeting and he felt a little left out because he got so much airtime the last few. I, I thought we'd maybe give him some. All right. Um, again, I'll just mention that uh, if you want to want to stay for one, lunch, you're you're welcome to with that uh, meeting adjourned. <laughs>